Good evening. I'm Edel Howland. Welcome to Red, White and Blue. We're together to celebrate America's independence. But that sense of unity was short-lived. The deaths of two black men shot by police officers in Louisiana and Minnesota on July 5th and 6th sparked nationwide protests. And on July 7th, following a peaceful protest in Dallas, a lone shooter killed five police officers and wounded seven people. These shootings left many people shaken and anxious. We went into Houston neighborhoods to ask citizens about how they're feeling. Well, it seems like nobody really has solutions. That's the one thing that's kind of absent from the whole discussion. Uh, one thing is just to educate people what to do when you're stopped by the police. I feel like for us black males, it's not safe. It's scary out there. That's all I can say. I, I'm afraid to go places people of my race, African, will be happy when justice is served. I have a little brother who's a police officer, and so from a personal point of view, you know that they're good guys who really want to make a difference. It's just sad right now. Um, I feel like we could all come together on some agreement. We're going downhill while the shootings. Every, every person is a human being, so everyone should give each other respect. Everybody should look at each other side of the story before it be any killing. Just need peace and justice in the country, that's all. What is an appropriate response to these tragedies and how do we move forward? We'll address these issues tonight. Joining us for this special edition of Red, White and Blue are Craig Washington, former member of the US House of Representatives, Executive Assistant Chief with the Houston Police Department, Michael Durden, Representative of the Nation of Islam and Student Minister, Dr. Robert Muhammad, and president of the Houston Police Officers Union, Ray Hunt. And leading our discussion, our hosts David Jones and Gary Pollan. Well, I want to welcome to this distinguished panel, and it's uh, it's a pretty sad day for America that we're dealing with this. This, this is, and I have just a brief comment as we open, and that is, I thought we had this behind us, uh, the issues. That is disrespect for the police, disp disrespect for some civilians. Uh, it's really pretty sad, but I think that the people we heard in, in the videos are looking for solutions. What do we do about this problem? Not who do we blame? So I'll start first with you, Ray, since you represent the rank and file police officers. What can we do to make it safer on the streets for the police and the citizens? Well, when we have a good relationship with the public, it makes our police officers safer and the public safer. And I believe that we start that through communication. You don't do the communication after an incident. You start the communication before the incident so that you have relationships. When one of these things happen, we're able to sit down with, with both sides and be able to explain what's going on. We're all for transparency at the Houston Police Officers Union. We've even said that we're for getting the information out even quicker, even if it jeopardizes the jury pool in the Harris County area. We believe it's very, very important that the other side get to see the facts before we get false facts that are sent out there and then that are exasperated through the social media. For example, the situation, the last shooting that we had where information got out there that he didn't have a gun in his hand, that he had a Coke can. Well, that was just an absolute lie. The facts are there. The video camera will show about that. about the Houston shooting. The Houston shooting. The facts are there. The video will show it. And I think that it should have been out quicker so that we completely quell that immediately. But taking a step back and, and understanding it's, it's not easy being a policeman on the street. In fact, one of the things I've been advocating, as you know, for many years is uh, two-person police cars. Uh, it makes it a lot safer for the police officers and for the citizens because you don't have to worry, uh, I guess, be on a razor's edge when you're dealing with situations. But this situation with uh, with uh, the man with the gun, what can we do? Is there anything we can do about uh, these to make it safer out there for the police and for citizens, uh, in the case of the citizen in Minnesota who had a rightful right to carry in his car, he's stopped by the police, he tells, apparently tells the officers, I, had a, I have a gun, I have a concealed carry permit. And, and that, it, that you're getting from the media though. That's right. not, that's not so necessarily I, accurate information. And I understand. So part of it is we need accurate information. Correct. Maybe and Minnesota is not as forthcoming as, 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 as I we I was are. telling Mr. Muhammad in the room before we came in here that I have no problem with, with us sitting down within 24, 48 hours after a shooting, <clears throat> share with, with activists, share with everybody the information that we have so that we can get information out there and make sure that we keep the city safe. Former so, Chief, I mean, Executive Assistant to the Chief, Mr. Durden, I'd like to ask you whether or not the, whether HPDA has bias reduction strategies in place whenever they're training police officers? Actually, we do, but quite honestly, I think uh, those of us in law enforcement and even within HPD, we need to go a little bit further. And part of that bias reduction uh, uh, evaluation is to continue to ex 
educate our officers about issues related to implicit bias. There are training opportunities available throughout this country now, and they're emerging, but those are things that you can do in terms of psychological evaluation of folks before they become police officers and education and training of police officers once they're on the force. And so bias reduction, the understanding of the relationship between implicit bias and some of our reactions, not just police officers, but people in general, those are the focus and those are the things that we need to look at. And I wanted to, and I, and I, as a, and I appreciate those comments, but as a follow-up to what Ray Hunt said, uh, Dr. Muhammad, I wanted to get your reaction. Is that an idea that could work? That is, that there's open communications between the police department and the community leadership that you're a part of when these incidents take place, where the information is shared from both sides? It's always a good start and uh, is important. Mr. Farrakhan has said to me on several occasions, going all the way back to 1992 when then Governor mm -hmm. Ann Richards called uh, ecumenical council together to prevent riots after the second Rodney King trial. He said to me, brother, intelligent people always dialogue. So that's always been our position. But we got to go beyond talk because there's no substitute for justice. And so unless there's justice, then what is welling in the people's heart is, is they feel like there are two systems. There's one system for law enforcement uh, and a presumption of innocence, and then there is another for us on the street. Now, you know, a person's perception is their reality. And what we're dealing with is two different worldviews. And until we can reconcile those two worldviews through dialogue and through communication and understand each other, I'll, I'll close this point by simply saying this. Ray Hunt or the police or no one has to agree or believe what I believe. But as long as he believes that I believe what I believe, then we have a basis of respectful dialogue and we may disagree, we may agree to disagree, but at least he knows where I'm coming from and I know where he's coming from. And hopefully you have and, each other's phone beginning. number so you can reach and each Craig, other quickly. Craig Washington has actually written laws and has actually defended people accused of crimes and uh, probably a police officer or two is my guess, has been a client of yours. So mm, why don't few. you give us a broad view, if you can, of what, where, where we are as a country in relation to this problem of police and mostly black American relations? I think we've missed some opportunities, <clears throat> but I think that, excuse me, this presents, at least for Houston, a, a wonderful opportunity. Out of tragedy comes good things. I think we ought to multitask. We ought to take advantage of the fact that uh, we live in an age when uh, people use smartphones and things like that, like Ray was talking about so that you can gather information in a different way. I, I don't think that we should focus in one area. I think we should do what the chief said and go forward with implicit bias and, all, and screening officers. And all those things can be done at the same time. But one of the things that I was really shocked about, and I'm ashamed that I was shocked about it, is when Chief Brown, I think his name is up there in Dallas, said how much they get paid. Come on now. They need to be paid a whole lot more than we ask people to go into places in the dark of night and put their lives in jeopardy, and, and we want to pay them $40,000? Come on now. I mean, we, we got to do better. We, we got to do better for the job that they do. That doesn't change the things that we're talking about, but it sure takes the stress off. If I was out there risking my life every day for $40,000, it, it would affect how I felt about the job. And thank God they don't feel like I would feel about it. But but we're all in this together. We're one community. And it doesn't. I'm not so much interested, David, respectfully, in thinking about where we've been. I'm thinking about where we are and where we need to go. We can solve this problem. We are smart people. We are intelligent human beings. If we can put our preconceived notions of each, uh, each other aside and focus on the fact that, that we're all in this together. Uh, as Martin Luther King said, we're either going to live together as brothers or we're going to die together as fools. Well, yeah. Muhammad, Mr. Muhammad said in the, uh, in the room prior to coming in here about uh, some things that I think are, should be brought up, and that is, uh, would be illustrated by the Minnesota event, you know, the shooting in Minnesota. We hear about St. Paul, big city, St. Paul. No, happened in a small little suburb. Seven percent of the population of that suburb, uh, suburban town was, was white. Uh, the gentleman that was killed had been stopped 52 times on traffic 
And I'm just wondering whether or not we have uh, certain populations of people who may be seeing the police a whole lot more than they should be. Well, but that, that but David, that, that's part of the, that's talking I'll, I'll about the problem. I ask him a question, right. Gary. I ask him a question. <laughs> <laughs> What we have to do is we have to deal with America's original sin. You, see, you cannot go forward if you don't know where you've been, and you can't go forward if you don't know where you are. We talk bias, but it really boils down to racism. And until we deal with our prejudices and our, and, and our in, and inherent racism, then we're, we're not going to solve the problem. Now, that doesn't mean, look, you're not responsible for what your fathers did, whether you own slaves or not, it's in your family or not. But today, nowadays, we're going to have to go together. I want to make this point, and it, and it, it tags <clears> on to what uh, Congressman Representative, former Co Representative Craig Washington just, just Craig. said. Uh, oh, he wants to be known as Craig. Just Craig. Well, Craig, he's just Craig. Yeah. <laughs> what just Craig said is just simply this. We make our police officers be the thin blue line between community and chaos. Right. We ask them to to uh, to guard a community when they're closing our schools at HISD. We ask them to uh, to uh, be over uh, unemployment that's disproportionate in the black community. We ask them to sit by when we see on television that uh, we have tax free loaders, Gary, that are parking trillions of dollars offshore while we need three point six trillion dollars worth of infrastructure. If we built that infrastructure, just about everybody can get a job. The good news is, is that we're closing the, the educational gap. But where is the blue collar path to the middle class? Someone's pulled up the ladder. So now we have this what you call permanent underclass and then we're asking them to keep order. And that's not right. We need equity in the community. We need justice in the community. We need fairness in the community. And, and stop putting it on them. Yeah. They're not <laughs> social workers. Yeah, it sounds like uh, Robert is, uh, is is endorsing Donald Trump. But I don't want to go into presidential <laughs> politics. David, go ahead, Ray. I, I just can't. I don't know where you no, could possibly get he's that. He's going to take us on a rocket ship to hell. But that's <laughs> all right. We're I don't know where you could possibly get that stat that he was stopped 52 times on traffic. And I have a feeling that somebody said that and somebody posted that on the Internet and, that's and somebody guess. ran with it. Because let me tell you, this internet has has caused people to believe things. Uh, we had a captain in our department call me today and said, "Hey, did that guy really have a gun out there, or was it a, was it a coke can?" Even people who are reasonable are believing that crap. Mm -hmm. And if 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 we had done what I'm proposing and saying, if we sit down with the activists within 24 to 48 hours after a situation, nobody would have doubted that that person had a gun, that that person was the officers thought they were being flagged down by somebody in the street and and on that body camera you can hear one of the witnesses out on the, on the side say I don't know why he had a gun I don't know why he had that gun who we think may be the same person who later said he didn't have a gun so when, when people start spreading misinformation it's like but, the but hands up don't shoot that, in in addition, I, I think in addition to that one of the things that we have to do as leaders of our institution is that we have to learn how to communicate with people in a way that allows us to speak to their pain. Because some of the expressions and the outward expressions and the protests, it's a reflection of the things that people feel, the pain that people feel when they don't believe they're part of the process. So while we're in the process of modifying our policies and procedures and all of that stuff, we have to recognize and remember that policies and procedures don't interact with people. Uh, people interact with things. people. Mm -hmm. Two quick things picking up on what they said. If we could find a word other than racism to, to because it gets everybody's fist up. They, 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 you go into corners because it, it, it hurts and it puts people on the defensive and uh, if South Africa can solve the problem, at least from our appearance at this distance, that they had, and Lord knows a whole lot worse than, than what we, well, I don't, I don't know, worse, but it was at least as bad by truth and reconciliation say I forgive you for what you did to me let's go on let's go on together we, we got to live here in this community together I forgive everything that happened before and let's 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 put that aside but, but find another word for it but it was true remember though when you were talking about forgiveness and reconciliation right. brother Craig but it was truth right I said people truth had and reconciliation. yeah you did but right. you kept selling forgiveness forgiveness it, without truth, there can be no there can be no justice, and without any justice, there can't be I any peace. What what Ray Hunt and this is scaring me to death. What Ray Hunt is saying, I I, I want to pursue that because if we have the truth in front of us, 
then we may walk out of that particular meeting and say, you know something, we're protesting on the street, but maybe we're protesting the wrong thing. Okay, but here's, or, here's or, one we, or we did see something, and, and I don't care whether they cover down or not. This, this, there's something wrong with this, this, this stop or this shooting. Here's mm -hmm. the truth, at least in my mind, that there are police officers who will see another police officer committing a crime on a citizen and lie about it. There you go. Happens That's all the, time, the truth. Right? It happens right. all the time. That needs yeah. to stop who, happening. Who says that? No because good police officers should cover up for a bad police officer because right. they do good police officers harm. It might be two, a small percentage of people right. are, are bad. We have about 800 IED complaints filed a year, and about six of them come from police officers on police officers. Right. Yeah, right. And, and Craig, understand, we have over 800,000 licensed law enforcement officers in America. Right. And the complaints we've heard about and the things that the media has, has made a big deal, some in which case it was appropriate, some right. it turns out were not. One's too a many. A small percentage. One is yes. too many. And I agree, but you're going to get bad apples everywhere. But I want to ask another question. But we need to get the bad apples out. Well, oh, I, I the agree. police officers well, would lead the, the way in the bad apples get the bad out. Out. The rest get the of us would feel better about no, no, them doing that work. What I think we need to do, guys, to be honest, I think the traditional approach to handling issues uh, related to the discussion we're having has been a transactional approach. We deal with each incident as if it was an individual mm -hmm. transaction. Mm -hmm. And all of us together need to move beyond that and make our, our dealings right. and our recipes for moving forward, they have to be more transformational. You can't deal with single issue transaction. It has to be transferred. Now, I'm just right. telling you, if this man had watched the video and seen all the facts that we have on that shooting the other night, mm -hmm. like Assistant well, Chief Durden sure saw, he would now. come out and say, y'all, unfortunately, this person is probably going to be intoxicated on something. He made some bad decisions, and unfortunately, the officers had to react the way they did. But, if he right. saw that, that's, that's right. what he'd be saying. Well, and I, and I know you're going right. to give an opportunity to see I want to. Let, right, I want right. to ask the other. I want to ask the other. I'm talking about before we get to that point. But let's all talk about the other side. So you talked about Chief Jordan had some interesting ideas yeah. of how we can make uh, the police uh, more sensitive that they, as they need to be in dealing with different communities. Right. Uh, you all have had a lot of good ideas. But let's talk about the people, the citizens interacting with the police. I found a fascinating statistic preparing for this show, and I was stunned to read it. And that was the DOJ J report about arrest-related deaths, because based on all the media publicity, I was thinking that the, the, the African-American numbers were going to be off the charts. Now, it turns out, actually, 42% of those killed are white, 32% right. black, 20% Hispanic. Now, right. the black number, to be fair, is out of proportion to the black percentage of the population, but that may be related to arrests. But I want to talk about, so how do we treat and teach the people who interact with the police how to behave so we don't have these situations take place? That, I don't know. That, I mean, I'm asking that, the that question. Is, that, is, that is not the police's job. No. Right. That is my job. Okay. Right. That is our job. So how do we do And Well, here, here, here's the difficulty. The difficulty is, is that we have gang task force money, homeland security money coming down to Chief Sorensky now. But we don't have any gang prevention money that we want to give to community groups and organizations. People are afraid to say, if I give money to Robert Muhammad or something affiliated to him, how they're going to get slammed. We can go throughout the community and we could bring about peace and gang truces so there will be less tension in the community. The Nation of Islam has an 86-year track record of taking the worst of the worst and turning trash into treasure. We do that. Now, if someone would, 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 would say, okay, let's partner up and let's do what we've got to do, monitor it, do whatever you want to do, we can, we can make a change along with the other groups and organizations in the community, but we have to have the same resources and the same believability that others have. It is not a policing problem. We're making a policing problem. They, they are becoming the, the, the default for the failure of families, education, economics, or, and we're asking them to guard, to be the guardians of greed and inequity. It's wrong, and until we get them out of the middle of that fight, we will not have any peace. Let me see if either one of uh, either Ray Hunt or Chief Darden, uh, is it all right if I call you Chief Darden? You can call me Michael. <laughs> huh? Michael? <laughs> yeah. Um, have you heard of, uh, the, I just learned about this program called the Make It Right program where they're, at least in precincts <coughs> two and eight, they're inviting people to come in that uh, this most recent event was Windsor Village. Actually, where they actually are the getting one at Windsor Village was precinct seven. I precinct was involved seven. in the planning and And they are getting rid of low-level warrants. Yes. 
All right, so it seems to me like there's a harm reduction strategy that could be going on in this, this and other communities. After all, we don't want to be Ferguson where everybody's got 15 or 20 warrants because they're making money off of the deal. But, but again, deal. That, that, that's an example of something that's transactional. What I was right. speaking to in terms of transformation or the things that mm -hmm. Minister Muhammad was talking about, mm -hmm. one of the fallacies of community policing, in my opinion, is that the institutions in this country have left it up to the police to talk about and go out and teach people about uh, crime prevention, safety for children, uh, how to interact with the police, a number of factors. The essence of community policing, the essence of proactive community policing, was that we have effect effective partnerships with organizations that go out and assist us in doing that. And when you have those effective partnerships of a number of people going out to do those things to improve my communities, that's what I mean when I talk about transformational. Those good transactional mm -hmm. things are really, really great. Mm -hmm. They're helpful to people on the individual. Mm -hmm. But in terms of bridging the gap where people can communicate with each other and communicate in a way that is respectful of the other person, we need really, really transformational uh, leadership. Uh, Craig, is there anything we can do to reduce media incitement? Because it, it sure seems to me like the media is not interested, in, certainly not interested in solutions. We are, but they're not. They're interested in getting people agitated and excited in, every, in whatever the thing is, whatever position people take, that's what they want to do. Because they I, figure I, that many people watch and create I hate to think that, 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 they really, that they really feel that way. I, maybe I'm just naive. Uh, I think they take advantage of the situation when they when they go out. I, but but at the same time, <clears throat> excuse me, they have First Amendment right to broadcast whatever they want. But bring them into the conversation rather than have them be the observer on the sideline looking at what happens. Bring them in beforehand. Let them go out like to to community groups to sh when when nothing's happening. Nothing in quotes. Mm -hmm. When when you go to the churches, these politicians know where to find the voters when they want them. They go to churches on Sundays and mosques and stuff like that. Let them go out to those same places, take police officers and sit activists side by side and talk about the things that we agree on. Stop arguing about the things we don't agree on and, and, and double down on the things we do agree on and make the media part of it. I'm sorry. Let me ask, let me ask you. The Houston Chronicle editorial that was written today is doing nothing more than inciting violence and it's full of lies. They have no information about the shooting. I have a feeling I know who wrote it, but what I don't know because he won't put his name on there. It's complete lies. If you read the paper today in the editorial that says justified shooting question mark, all the information they're getting off the internet, they're getting off uh, blogs, it, it, it's doing nothing more than inciting violence. Well, can you, can you address my concern, which is reducing the conflict that is out yes. there between officers and you know, uh, we, we uh, the black, Houston black, police, black Houstonians. We one, the of them, Houston one, police. Of, one of them would be, and I'm going to ask you if you agree with it, a citation and release program that would keep officers on the street putting citations rather than arresting bond and the whole nine yards. We've supported Devin Anderson on that on low levels of marijuana. We support May Walker on the on the pro, uh, plan that they did. Anything that we can do to improve relations. Look, if somebody's got their two or three minor warrants cleared up, they're less likely to run from the police whenever we go right. to stop them. They're less likely to get into a chase. We have no problems with that. We, we, the Houston Police Officers Union, has been going out to schools. We're going to juvenile probation shortly. We're going in there and telling them how we want them to, to do when we talk, stop them on traffic. And I heard something from a group of Worthing students two weeks ago, and their number one complaint was, we don't believe that you respect teenagers whenever you stop them on traffic. That was, that was solid for me, and I've shared that with our officers. That's the kind of communication that we need, and I'd welcome going around with you to any school, that we go in there together and that we show exactly what should take place so that they know that, that we're communicating and they should be communicating. I believe we the mayor, I believe the mayor is in support this, of citation this, and release. This, this division that's going on is a threat to national security because the, the mantra is if you see something, say something. But if in the black community, we perceive that when the police do a wrong, one another, they won't say anything. Not that you they're not following ID, but who knew that until you said it, it was said on a radio show and on this television show. Mm -hmm. And if now we condemn our young people for having a no snitch rule, nobody's telling anybody anything, and then there's a bomb left somewhere, and we're just because we protect 
our mm. city hall and our airports, <clears throat> but the but asymmetrical warfare is picking now soft targets. Neighborhoods are the problem, and if we don't come together, we are we are, we are threat. It's a threat to our national security but, and our survival. But Gary and Dave, I want to tell y'all that everything that we're talking about are these five percent that that aren't trusting this. Ninety-five percent of all races, and I go around to the black churches. I'm going to another one this Sunday. Support us. Come up, say thank you for your mm -hmm. job. Still call on the police when they need us. Right. They respect the police and they somewhat trust the police. Yes, I know that the black community is less trusting than, than other communities, but we can bridge that gap. I'm right. telling you that most of the problems that we're that we're hearing and that these protest marches that are trying to do things that are violent are the five percent that hate the police of all races. Would wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt, would it, uh, Chief, if we could just get these people from carrying these large, long weapons to their peace protests? That, would, that doesn't help, does it? Well, well let, let me be very frank. Uh, I, and, it depends on who you And we get you, a number see, of questions to, sorry, about uh, sorry, the again, that, that, that could be a yes or no one. Yes, but this time's up. <laughs> the fact of the matter you don't is. You have to tell David in the green room. <laughs> That's it. He's Craig, about to finish. Craig Washington, <laughs> Chief Gurdon, Robert Muhammad. Ray Hunt, I want to thank you all for coming. These are some wonderful ideas you've come up with, and I think we've actually pushed the ball down the field towards solutions, which we need. And we want to thank you for watching this week, this special edition. Check us out on the web and on Facebook, and we will be back right here soon on Red, White, and Blue.